of which we will say with a little extra fervor because of the weather, we say, blessed are you, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has granted us life, who has sustained us and maintained us, and brought us to this wonderful day. And the cantor will now say that better. Cantors. We have three Russian cantors. Okay. <laughs> they will do it better. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, I'm Rabbi Lustig. Tonight is about resilience. Tonight is about resilience, determination, and faith. And that is just speaking to the drive here and home. We thank you and welcome you to Washington Hebrew Congregation and this historic evening, Let Freedom Sing. It is quoted, what lends meaning to history? The promise of the future. If there is no promise, there is no meaningful history. There is one gift, the Bible to the world. Promise, a vision, and a hope. History is not a flimsy course of disconnected happenings devoid of duration. History is the memory of the moments. It is the memory of history that holds together despair and hope, defiance and promise, in spite of the passion to refute all hope. History as we see it is the alternation of frustration and hope. Its memory is in the cleaving to the promise. Man cannot live without a future. Man cannot live significantly without the past. Genuine history endures. It is the philosopher and theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel who wrote these powerful words. It is our memory, our history, and our future that we celebrate tonight. We seize the confluence of events that brings us here tonight to celebrate to mark and make history. On this snowy and icy Sunday, December 8th is the closest day to the Human Rights Day, which will be the very day the world will stop and honor the memory and legacy of Nelson Mandela, who understood the power of the desire to be free and lived his life dedicated to that one objective, freedom. We gather to remember the vigilance, determination that the free Soviet Jewry movement represented in our nation's capital. Through, yet again, the brilliant work of the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Washington, as we see this powerful exhibit, Voices of the Vigil, which records and teaches the critical role Washington's Jewish community played in this historic movement. Our efforts to free Soviet Jews galvanized our community, young and old, Orthodox and reform, Jew and Gentile alike stood vigil and gathered to demand that human rights be given to our brothers and sisters in the former Soviet Union. I remember, as many of you do, vividly the day we stood shoulder to shoulder on the United States Capitol's mall, 250,000 strong, it was a statement to the world about our beliefs in democracy, 
freedom and the values Judaism has bequeathed to both of those principles. We hope that our vigilance would transform the lives of those who desperately sought to be free. Tonight as well, we celebrate that hope realized in one soul, Cantor Mikhail Manovich, who sought such freedom and through his gifts has actualized it in a way that has galvanized our community and given meaning to all of our vigils. We come in respect and admiration for his gifts of music, of the heart, his gifts of love of Judaism. He and Emma, his beloved wife, immigrated to the U.S. and built a life and a career that has led Misha to serve this historic congregation, one of our nation's largest and oldest. His talents and musical genius is recognized nationally and internationally, but his warmth, his laugh, and his humanity is felt here daily at Washington Hebrew Congregation by the families that he serves. We celebrate his 25 years through the very gifts he's given to us, music. On our 13th annual December concert, we dedicate it to him and these 25 years of service. We will hear from three Russian tenors and our own Cantor Bortnik tonight as we celebrate Misha's extraordinary talents and his heroic rise from New York City taxi cab driver and courier messenger to one of America's most beloved cantors. We must realize tonight the power of history. One man's story, one man's career encapsulates the true significance of those moments of vigil. For without clinging to the promise of the future, without the hope and realization of freedom, there would be no song, there would be no future. What lends meaning to history? The promise of the future. If there is no promise, there is no meaningful history. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we celebrate meaningful history. Tonight, we make meaningful history. We welcome you. We welcome you to let freedom sing. It's my pleasure to call upon Norman Goldstein to introduce our speaker tonight. On behalf of the Society and our committee members, Joan Dodek, Danny Mann, Jack Minker, Bert Silver, and Marsha Weinberg, I want to thank Rabbi Lustig and the Washington Hebrew Congregation for hosting tonight's event and also for providing a home for our exhibit for the next four months. And how fitting that this opening falls so close to Human Rights Day. I also want to extend our congratulations to Cantor Manovich for his 25 years of outstanding service to the congregation as Cantor and to thank him for putting together tonight's concert. Our community thanks the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Washington, in particular its executive director, Laura Applebaum, for its vision in creating Voices of the Vigil, which tells the story of one of the most memorable periods in all of our lives, when we truly transformed the world. Together, we brought down the Soviet Union and made it possible for more than one million of our fellow Jews to emigrate for is to Israel and for countless others to live in countries of their choosing. Free to make Aliyah as a result of our protests, the great numbers of new and highly skilled olim changed the face of Israel and guaranteed its long-term survival as a sovereign state, particularly in the eyes of its surrounding Arab neighbors. We supported and nurtured the rebirth of Jewish life and culture in the former Soviet Union. We did all this as a united Jewish people supported by many other people of goodwill, all with a common purpose of ensuring the dignity and human rights of our fellow Jews and of other persecuted people whose religious freedoms and other rights had been suppressed for so long. Started by a group of college students in California, the Soviet Jewry movement took hold across the country in the late 1960s. 
Thereafter, from 1970 to, 1970 to 1991, we in the Washington community protested, marched, wrote letters, and petitioned. Led by our rabbis and Christian leadership, like Pastor John Steinbrook of Luther Place Church, who rallied his congregants to attend the daily vigil on Shabbat and Jewish holidays, many of you were arrested, prosecuted, and served time in jail to demonstrate your commitment to the cause of human rights. How many of you still have your bracelets proudly bearing the names of prisoners of conscience, Eden Udell, Yosef Mendelevich, Yosef Begun, and the Slay Packs? These bracelets are displayed in our exhibit. How many of our children were twinned with, wrote to, and, and celebrated become a bar or bat mitzvah with a Soviet Jewish child who was denied the right and privilege to become a bar or bat mitzvah? Twinning is in the exhibit too. I am certain that all of us remember the empty talit covered chair on the bima and the aliyah named in honor of a prisoner of conscience, a refusenik, and how our congregations prayed for the day that he or she would join them in worship sometime in the future. All of us can still see the free Soviet Jewry signs that were at every synagogue and Jewish institution in the area. Surely you remember the calls to help those who became members of our community, whether it was to resettle, provide furniture, clothing, dishes, jobs, education, medical care, or other assistance. Our community responded generously. Our federation, synagogues, schools, and agencies were there to provide help of all, all sorts. And we were there to welcome them into our homes and our hearts. That's why tonight's tribute to Cantor Manovich and the concert is so meaningful to all of us. We still hear the plaintive voice of that delicate and fragile, yet incredibly powerful Avital Sharansky, standing with us, pleading to be reunited with her husband, who was taken away from her without reason and without cause, almost immediately after they were united in marriage. Can any one of us forget our surreptitious trips to visit our heroes and heroines in Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, or Odessa as we schlepped medicines, baby foods, and religious articles to enable them to survive and live as Jews? We all recall the important roles of the Washington Committee for Soviet Jewry and the Jewish Community Council, especially briefings by the Council's Buddy Sislin, who taught us how to get around how to explain to immigration officials why we needed to bring sidurim, diapers, chanukiot, and the invaluable Levi's and electronic products that enabled our people to survive. Just thinking of those walk-up apartments where we brought comfort to our Soviet Jewish brethren, letting them know that there were millions of people in solidarity with them, supporting them, protesting on their behalf around the world, and daily shouting, let our people go on 16th Street across from the Soviet Embassy should bring a sense of pride in all of us. And then there was the incredible 1987 Soviet rally on the National Mall. It was a magnificent clear cold day. Days before the event, newspapers asked us to guesstimate the audience, the attendance. We had no idea. But on that famous day, which President Reagan cited to Premier Gorbachev, our community produced more than 60,000 protesters of the massive crowd of more than 250,000. According to Ambassador Richard Shifter, who negotiated the treaties with the Soviets, President Reagan said he would not engage in any serious discussions unless Gorbachev responded to the recent pleas in Reagan's backyard to free Soviet Jewry. In a matter of weeks, Gorbachev capitulated and the exodus began. This is also part of the exhibit. As we think back on the recent festival of Hanukkah, we recall that each night during the years of the Soviet Jewry struggle, we lit candles in honor of our Jewish heroes and heroines behind the Iron Curtain, who were not afraid to risk their lives to declare their pride in being Jewish. And during Pesach, 
How can any of us ever forget our readings about the matzah of hope, hope that just as our forefathers were released from bondage in Egypt, our contemporary families, which were similarly repressed in the former Soviet Union, would be freed from the darkness of oppression. What was it that symbolized all of these efforts, all of these passionate labors? It was our daily vigil, every day for 20 years, rain or shine, cold or hot, holiday or not. Originally conceived by the one and only Moshe Brodetsky, it was the international focal point of the effort on behalf of Soviet Jewry and to fight suppression of human rights for all behind the Iron Curtain. Every local synagogue, many churches, and almost all Jewish organizations coming to D.C. took time out from their schedules to share in the cry, let our people go. It is that vigil and its memories that the Jewish Historical Society's Voices of the Vigil exhibit brings to life for all of us to enjoy and reminisce. The vigil was not only a place for protest. It, on special occasions, it became a place of communal joy, as many of our heroes, on whose behalf we had protested for years, came to celebrate their freedom. Who can forget their faces as they thanked all of us and then joined us in protesting on behalf of those who remained behind awaiting their freedom? And the daily vigil was even more. It was where Jews from all denominations, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, Reconstructionist, Humanist, Secular, along with many other faith communities and people of goodwill, were united in common purpose for a higher cause. Would that we could have that same spirit today. It is in that spirit that I invite, well, that we invite all of you to visit the Voices of the Vigil exhibit Bring your friends, children, and grandchildren to witness and to educate them as to what our community did and what we can do to change the world when we work together for a common purpose. By carrying out the ideal of tikkun olam, we can improve our community and preserve and ensure the future of our Jewish people, our institutions, and values. We encourage you to use the historical societies website and educational materials about the vigil and Soviet Jewry movement. And when we think of the cause of Soviet Jewry and the symbolism of the daily vigil, we also think of another constant symbol in the effort. There was one person, above all, who reflected the commitment to human rights, to Jewish survival, and to enduring the most severe punishments with dignity. A man who, at great personal expense, survived every effort to diminish his commitment to the greater cause, and when ultimately freed, still managed to defy his oppressors by walking a path as a free man as he crossed the bridge to freedom. Trained as an engineer, preferring to be and describing himself as a chess player, ultimately reunited in Israel with his wife. We are now honored to have him as a spokesman for the Jewish people from around the world in his role as chairman of the executive of the Jewish Agency for Israel. I ask you to welcome perhaps the shortest giant you will ever meet, Natan Sharansky. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, Norman. You used very effectively your membership on the board of the Jewish Agency, threatening not to vote with me if I will not come here. So thank you for bringing me. Uh, thank you, Raul Lastic, for your hospitality, uh, dear friends. Um, there are so many ways to speak about Soviet Jewry movement. I will start from one episode in the final stages of uh, 
my interrogations before the trial. Uh, when the interrogations are fin finished and there are preparations for the trial, I have the right to see the materials which are used against me. So there was 15,000 pages of materials because it was prepared as a case against all our movement. And there are different pictures and films which are also part of the accusation against me. So I, suddenly I'm reading descriptions of these films and suddenly I realize that one of them is, has the pictures of my wife. So I ask to see it. They try to say it's enough that you read it, you don't have to see it. But I insisted, I have, you are using it in the court against me. I don't have the lawyer because I refused to have their lawyer. They didn't permit me to have my lawyer. So I need to see every bit of information which you are using against me. So in the end, it's, well, I was surprised pleasantly, but they showed me the film. It was Granada film, shot 20 minutes film, made uh, by, on a British TV about one of the demonstrations. And uh, they used it because they were interviews of people who knew me personally, who were explaining how I was helping to send information about our struggle. So they were using as the proof of my illegal activity. But there, this demonstration I see is a demonstration in front of Soviet embassy in London and suddenly my wife, together with many people, goes to the embassy. So suddenly, after all this year and a half of interrogations, when I saw nothing, I knew nothing what's happening in the world, here is like my wife is coming straight to prison and is demonstrating together with others. So the, the film finished, 20 minutes. I said that I didn't understand what here and sentence there because it's all in English. So I want to see it again. So they were resisting, but I insisted they showed me the second time. After it was finished for the second time, I said that I didn't understand many things, I want to see it again. And then at the head of this team, I had a team of 17 uh, uh, interrogators, and the colonel Volodin, he became very angry. And he started shouting, he said, what you think they will help you, these people will help you. Look, look at the screen who they are. They are a bunch of students and housewives. And we are KGB. You think they'll help you? I would say he gave the great definition of our movement, students and housewives. In fact, after I was released from prison, I was using this term very often, thanking students and housewives, and it in fact became the name of our movement. So he was absolutely right in describing it as the movement of students and housewives. I have to say here on the pictures, I saw many of them. So for example, one of the first that I met in Moscow was Iron Manikovsky, related to Iron Manikovsky, who was the head of Washington branch of Union of Struggle for Soviet Union. And there are many also students. And they were the army. In fact, if to think how all this struggle was built, uh, again, I'll give only one episode, but there were so many, thousands and thousands. We were having our demonstrations. And our demonstrations, of course, were a little bit smaller than demonstration here on the, on, on the mall in 1987. The successful demonstration was 10 Jews, standing in the center of Moscow with the slogan, give us visas to Israel or free prison of Zion for five minutes. Why no more than 10 Jews? Because more Jews will know in advance about demonstrations, the more the chance that KGB will know, and then there'll be no demonstration. Why only five minutes? Because even if KGB doesn't know in advance, how long you can stand in the center of Moscow with such slogans, before you'll be arrested. Five minutes maximum. And then there is punishment. 15 days, 30 days, five years. Two of my friends got for one of such demonstrations. 
So the question is, what is the, uh, why to do this? Uh, the pleasure of standing for five minutes in the company of 10 people, and then to go for five years to Siberia. But the thing is, if this demonstration is organized correctly, and that was one of my obligations for in the last years before my arrest, to be in contact with the foreign press. And of course, the foreign press lived in special three buildings in Moscow, like special ghettos for foreign press, where you could not contact them without KGB being present. Uh, and so the challenge is, while meeting with them in the presence of KGB and having a conversation with them, that they'll get a message from you about the place and time when there'll be demonstration, and KGB will not understand it. And it took a lot of time to develop this language and use many tourists who will uh, uh, help us to deal with people, in, uh, with the activists in Washington or in New York, and they will deal with the journalists, and that's how we will coordinate our language. And so, if it is organized well, and KGB doesn't know in advance about this demonstration, but at least one journalist will come from New York Times or from BBC, today we don't like these words, but then for us it was absolutely the, the, uh, the uh, highest moment of success if one of these journalists will come. So, in, uh, in the morning we have demonstration and we are arrested. In the evening they'll broadcast on BBC, on Voice of America, on Radio Liberty, on Call Israel, they'll bo bro broadcast about this demonstration. And next day, physically, tens and hundreds of thousands of students and housewives go on their demonstrations, write letters to their congressmen, come to Washington and lobby and demand immediate actions. And then State Department uh, has to call for Soviet ambassador for explanations. And then congressmen and senators are passing resolutions. And then they link the interests of the Soviet Union to the most, uh, the most important interests of the Soviet Union with our struggle. And that's how our struggle was developing. In fact, here I was glad, it was a pleasant surprise to see Richard Perl here. Uh, if one day historians will look at the Jackson Amendment, they of course will hear the voice of Jackson, but they will find out that the handwriting was of Richard Perl, I think. So, but that's exactly how Jewish community was working. That's how our struggle was immediately translated and supported and amplified and turned into something much, much bigger by, by students and housewives. Uh, and, that, and it was very reliable fighters. We knew that we can rely on them. I remember, after all, we, I was one of those absolutely assimilated Soviet Jews who grew knowing nothing about our heritage, about our history, about our faith, about our tradition. And then, and we knew very well that we are Jews because there was anti-Semitism, because it was written in the idea of your parents, because all the conversations are about restrictions for Jews. So it was very negative your Jew. There was nothing positive. It was like to have a cancer, to be a Jew. You, ha you have a lot of restrictions. And then after 1967, when we discovered that everybody, everybody around us is connecting us to Israel, those who hate us and those who love us, for them we are connected to Israel. So we want to find out what it means. And we are reading in the underground, we are reading the uh, books from the, uh, from the tourists. We got some books about Israel, about Jewish people and suddenly you discover what a great history you have, and you can be part of it if you want. History which begins from exodus from Egypt, and then you discover that there are such a thing as Jewish people. Here are all these tourists who are coming, these uh, students and housewives, and they're telling you that, you know, your father is from Odessa, and, I'm, and my father or my grandfather is from Odessa. If only he will stay in Odessa and your father will move to Toronto, or to Miami, or to Washington, today I'll be in your place and you'll be in mine. We want to help you. We are 
We are a family. And you discover that really all these Jewish people scattered all over the world, they're one shtetl, one family. And above all this, you discover that there is a state, the state of Israel, which is ready to send airplanes to the end of the world, but, uh, but to bring you freedom. And that was such a powerful discovery of your history, of your family, of Jewish people, and of Israel. And you knew that you can rely on it. In the, but the, the KGB tried to convince me for all these years of my arrest that I'm isolated, that uh, Jews of the world are afraid even to mention our names because they, they know that we are accused in espionage, in treason, that all this struggle is finished. And they knew they are lying because for the few, last years before my arrest, I as a spokesman of our movement met with all those Jews who were coming from America, from Philadelphia, from New York, from Washington, from Miami, from London. And I was sure that I was absolutely sure that they continue the struggle. And of course, I was sure that the day will come and Israel will send their plane to bring me. And of course, I was sure that my wife continues the struggle every day. Well, I didn't know anything practically uh, about her leading the massive demonstrations and opening the doors of all the kings and uh, presidents. But I was absolutely sure that she is supported by Jewish people and she continues the struggle. In fact, uh, I describe in my book how I, from time to time, in order to change the atmosphere of interrogations, I tried to show to them that they should stop lying to me, that I know the truth, that I have my own sources of information. And I, in order to impress them, I was telling them that some fact, which I didn't know, but I was sure that that's happening. I was telling them, what you're telling that the world forgot me. I know that only some time ago, a Vital organized press conference in Washington with Father Dryden. And they look puzzled. And they, well, they say, well, uh, they try to dismiss it. And in fact, I didn't know about it. I didn't know that Father Dryden at that moment became the chairman of the Congressional Committee of Struggle for Soviet Jewry. Uh, but because I met Father Dreinen in Moscow uh, in one of the critical moments of our struggle, and, I, and by the way, it was the first uh, Catholic priest that I never ever met in my life. Uh, and I was so surprised by his depth of his solidarity uh, with our people and uh, with our struggle, and that he was ready, like, like every Jewish housewife, he was ready to take every bit of information which I'll give to him and then to put it uh, in his underwear and to bring uh, through the border. And he then went to, together with me to the trial of one of future prisons of Zion and was interviewing their people and so, and you see how devoted he had. So I had no doubt that knowing that after all he is an important congressman in Washington that probably he is one of those who is often meeting with Avitali. And that's why I was telling them with absolute uh, confidence that I know exactly that there was another demonstration and so on. And it happened that all what they were saying was wrong and all what was I was saying was right, though I knew nothing what's happening and they uh, knew everything. Because the real truth was on our side and my confidence in Jewish people and those who were supporting us was absolute, was absolute. This, Four years of my working as a spokesman of our movement before my arrest and, uh, and many, meeting so many of you gave me such a confidence in, uh, in the absolute solidarity of Jewish people that I had no doubt about what is really happening in the world. Uh, there are a number of lessons which can be learned from this unique struggle. Uh, and I will mention a couple of them which are important for today. First of all, we should not, we should never be afraid 
of our differences among us and even about our internal wars among us. I, as a chairman of Jewish Agency, is dealing now with a lot of wars. You know this, uh, around the Kotel, there is one of the wars, some others, we are, we are dealing with all of them. And some people feel it is almost the end of the world, that the worst thing which is happening to Jewish people. I have to tell you, look back on our struggle for Soviet Jewry. It seems like a struggle of all the Jews united in one, yeah? I have to say, even on these pictures, people will not even understand today when they are watching and seeing that there are people from Conference for Soviet Jewry and Council for Soviet Jewry and Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry. Here, you can read under these photos. You know that many representatives of these organizations didn't talk to one another, fought with one another, accused one another on all types of things. I, as a spokesman, had to take risk or to put risk on the tourists twice in order they will deliver the documents, the same documents about refuseniks twice to New York to the two organizations which are on the same street in New York because these organizations will never talk to one another. That was typical normal situation. And you know what? And in the end, in the end, when a KGB arrested me and there was a long list of accomplices of anti-Soviet organizations, of my, it was, and the long list of people whom I met from different organizations, they were all on the same list and all these organizations were on the same list. And in the eyes of KGB, there was absolutely no difference. And they were right. Because there was no, the fact that there were so many different organizations, it gave opportunity to work on the grassroots and on the establishment level and on the religious and trade union. And uh, on, to, to, it gave opportunity to all of us to work together in one struggle. The other thing is, that we should never underestimate our power and we should not rely on the skepticism of establishment. Now that I'm establishment, I always tell to the young, don't rely on me, I'm establishment. Go ahead, wait when I'll join you, when I'll take all the credit, that's you know you, you will have won. That's the nature of establishment. And I have to say that the, our demonstration in Washington was a great example of it because I remember after I was released, and I came first time uh, to America, I saw here some pictures from that first visit. I met with President Reagan, met with the leaders of Jewish organizations. And then I called them that sooner or later I said Gorbachev will come with his first visit to America. Let us hundreds of thousands of American Jews will greet Gorbachev and remind him about hundreds of thousands of Soviet Jews who are behind the Iron Curtain. And you know, reaction of the establishment, of the leaders of the, was very cautious, was very uh, reserved. And after this, when I kept speaking about hundreds of thousands going to Washington, it was in, the, in, the, in, 90, in, in 86, year before Gorbachev came, then they became negative because they warned me that it's very responsible to use such big figures. First of all, who knows how many Jews are behind the Iron Curtain who want to come? Well, maybe there are only 10 or 15,000. Why are you speaking about 100,000? Second, from where you, you simply don't understand that in winter, hundreds of thousands will not come to Washington. There were specialists who made estimation, 17, 17,000, 17, that's the maximum figure which we, Jewish leaders, can bring to Washington in December. That was the decision. And the third was that, and how we Jews can be such a warmongers and destroy this wonderful atmosphere of love and detente and so on. As to the last issue, I simply went to, to President Reagan and told him that we want to organize a demonstration. I hope he has nothing against it. And he said, what, I? You would, somebody can think that I want to be a friend of Gorbachev when he keep, keeps his people in prison. Of course, do everything what you think is right to do. So I came and said, look, Reagan wants us to do this demonstration. Why you don't want? But the most important argument, of course, was how many Jews will really come. And I have to say, I started going from one community to the other. I visited 30 communities. In every community, everybody wanted to go on this demonstration. So at some moment, like 
three months before the demonstration, it was, became clear that everybody wants it, and then all the Jewish organizations were united in one and c created the committee, uh, mobilized a lot of money, took all the credit. So that's exactly what we need establishment for, to put their money, to t take the credit, and to make things moving. And, and the, uh, I don't remember how many buses and how many trains and how many airplanes we were rented, or how you say, we were uh, uh, taken on that day and brought to work. And you know, 250,000, less than I hoped, but much more, much more than everybody believed. And it became the most, the biggest demonstration in the history of Washington. As, and as uh, uh, Dick Shifter, by the way, I don't know if he's still here, I saw him recently here. Yeah, oh yeah, he's here, yeah. Who was correctly called by us dentist. Why dentist? He, as a dentist, he was coming to Moscow each time with a list of refusings and was taking out another refusing and another refusing, one by one being the representative, uh, the, the assistant of Secretary of State Schulz in the question of human rights. But as he witnessed later, this demonstration gave opportunity to, to uh, Reagan say you, to Gorbachev, you see my people will not let me do anything without opening the gates. And as I know now from Gorbachev's people, how they were all shocked. They were sure that they're coming in the atmosphere of detente when they already succeeded to decrease the pressure on the Soviet Union. And that now they will get many concessions from, uh, from America without really opening the day gate. They released me, they released 20 or 30 prisoners of Zion, they released Sakharov, and they thought it's enough. And suddenly American people show to them it's not enough, we will not compromise until you open the gates of the Soviet Union. And that was really the last act in the 25 years of that historical battle. Unbelievable battle, which if, if to think of the students and housewives and lawyers and doctors and engineers and scientists, everybody in his or her field, everybody with his or her organization, everybody with his or her community, created such an unbelievable pressure on the Soviet Union. And I'll finish with, with the story about 10 years after I was released. 10 years after I was released, for the first time I came back to the Soviet, then it was already Russia, and it was my first visit, and I was a minister in this, uh, of industry trade. In fact, I was a minister of industry trade. I had to come to negotiate trade agreements, and the Russian authorities wanted me very much to come. I was already recognized officially that I am not a spy, so, and they wanted to show that the times changed. And I put a condition, I will come if I will be permitted to visit Lefortov prison. Lefortov prison is KGB prison, which became my alma mater, where I spent a year and a half going through interrogations and uh, preparing myself for Gulag. So, you know, they, in the beginning, they said, well, the, the schedule doesn't permit, we have this meeting and this meeting. I said, no, but you have the, my visit in the Bolshoi Theater. I don't need it. I was many times in Bolshoi Theater. Uh, so I, uh, I prefer to go to Lefortov prison. So in the end, they agreed. And when I came to Lefortov prison, together with my mother uh, and my wife, uh, it, first of all, it, was, it looked like a theater. It was the most clean, the most bright, prison, the world, they, I asked them to take me to, to punishing cell. They said, no, we don't have any more punishing cells. I said, okay, I'll take you to punishing cell. So they asked me to wait for five minutes and then spoke by walkie-talkie. And then when I came to punishing cell, it was clear that somebody was taken out of it because uh, it was clear that uh, just before, first of all, the TV, these cameras, special cameras, we were, we were working. Uh, and second, 
the gods were hit, uh, there was no heat in the cell, but near the cell there are gods, they had a heat, so heat was open. From this you can understand that they were here on, just a few minutes ago. So they couldn't deceive really me, but okay, I, I didn't need to see the prisoners, I asked them to leave me alone with my wife. I told her some stories which she knew, but here she could see it, uh, about the punishing cell. Uh, I showed her how, you know, it's very cold there, and you have three cups of uh, hot water and three pieces of bread a day. So this cup of water in aluminum cup, it is very important that it's hot, not only that you can drink, but you can put it to different parts of your body uh, and to, to warm a little bit. So uh, I tried to show you how with one cup of water, uh, water you can warm all your body and all other tricks. And then we went out and there were a lot of journalists from all over the world because it was such an unusual thing that a uh, minister is visiting prison uh, as a guest where he spent before so many years. And the first question was, why are you doing it? Wasn't it kind of self-torturing? Isn't it uh, uh, to, to go through all these painful moments of your life? I said, to the contrary, it's so inspiring. Only think for a moment, 20 years ago, it was uh, 10 years after I was released, so it was 20 years after I was arrested. So I said, 20 years ago, the leaders of the most powerful secret police in the world, of the most powerful dictatorship, which controlled one third of the world. They were explaining me one after the other, all 17 uh, leading interrogators, they were explaining me that that is the end of Zionist movement in Russia. That the world abandoned us, that Jew Jewish leaders are afraid to mention our names. There'll be no more Jewish activism in the, in the Soviet Union. I said, 20 years passed, Soviet Union doesn't exist. KGB doesn't exist. One million Jews moved to Israel. Another million Jews moved to the other countries. 200 million people live not under this dictatorship. And all this happened because there was bunch, as they say, bunch of students and housewives who discovered their identity. And there was a bunch of Soviet Jews who discovered their identities. And there was the state of Israel. And we all united, had this battle, and we changed the world. That reminds us, and it should remind us every day, how big is our power, how strong we are as a people, with all our disagreements, with all our fighting. But when we remember that we are one family, when we remember that we have one history and we have one destiny, we really can change our life and the life of the world. Thank you for this. Thank you, Mr. Sharansky. Hi, I'm Barry Chasen. I'm a Russian Jew. Thank you. With my wife, Lynn, and with Jim and his wife, Lynn, we're co-chairs of the, this weekend's uh, uh, celebration of 25 years of Michael Manovich being our cantor. The past is prologue. In the 1960s, 4,000 people were allowed to leave Russia legally, and they weren't all Jews. During the Cold War, Soviet Jews were thought to be security risk and traitors. To apply for immigration, applicants, and often their entire families, would have to quit their jobs which in turn would make them vulnerable to charges of parasitism, which was a criminal offense. Soviet restrictions on 
religious education and expression prevented Jews from engaging in Jewish cultural activities and religious life. And requesting emigration was itself seen as an act of betrayal by the Soviet authorities. Michael Manovich and Emma Carlin grew up in this climate. Michael graduated from the Leningrad State Conservatory of Music in 1975, and he began working in a children's music school. He and Emma married later that year, and sometime after that, they applied for immigration. Michael quit his job because he was afraid that his employer would get in trouble for employing a Jew and Emma was expelled from college. They were subjected to untold indignities until they were permitted to leave. They couldn't work, they couldn't go to school, they couldn't practice their faith openly. They were treated with disrespect. And it was through the efforts of a small group of brave Russian Jews and some non-Jews, referred to as refuseniks, which featured our esteemed guest, Natan Sharansky, which helped open the doors for a quarter of a million people, mostly Jews, to leave the Soviet Union in the 1970s. And that was more than 60 times the amount that had been allowed to leave in the 60s. Michael and Emma were two of those Jews. They arrived in New York where Michael got a choir job at Temple Emanuel. He then was lucky enough uh, to study at the School of Sacred Music at Hebrew Union College. He supported his young family after he was honored by being asked to direct the Hebrew Union College's cantorial choir. After graduation, Michael began as a cantor at Temple Emmanuel. Michael, what is it with Temple Emmanuel? In Livingston, New Jersey. And actually, left to his own devices, uh, he might, the story might end there. But Emma heard about a position at her own Washington Hebrew congregation. And uh, those of you who know Emma know that she was not to be denied. <laughs> and finally, with a trace of exacerbation, Michael told Emma, if you're so interested, why don't you apply for us? And uh, those of you who are from Washington Hebrew uh, could easily hazard a guess as to what happened next. And of course, Michael has been with us for 25 years. If we're all some mix of nature and nurture, this is the environment that helped mold the man that Jim Klein is about to so eloquently describe. The Russian author Leo Tolstoy wrote that music is the shorthand of emotion. That may be true. But when Cantor Michael Manovich uses music to bring forth our emotions, he certainly is not resorting to shorthand. His magnificent voice stirs our souls with the beauty and the precision of the most elegant calligraphy. Now, this comparison may adequately describe his voice and his musical versatility. But to understand the essence of the man requires us to ask and answer some challenging questions. How, for example, could a person who as a child and young man was denied every opportunity to practice and express himself religiously, be so effective 
in training our B'nai Mitzvah students to read Torah, not just fluently, but with such emotion and feeling. How can a man who is so soft-spoken and self-effacing when you interact with him one-on-one -on -one, absolutely command a room the moment he steps onto the bima or performance stage? How could someone who grew up in a society where it was justifiable and often necessary to question the honesty of one's political leaders be such a trusting human being and manage to balance almost perfectly an unswerving love for his adopted country and the thoughtful skepticism of an engaged citizen. Perhaps the answers to these and other questions lies in another insight of Leo Tolstoy, who also wrote that the sole meaning of life is to serve humanity. Michael, when you are joining with our rabbis in Cantor Bortnik to lead us in worship, when you are with our families to officiate at occasions both joyous and sad, when you inspire people across the country when you sing at the prayer service for the president's inauguration, in all of these roles, you are pursuing humanity. And in doing so, you bring forth the humanity that is within each of us. It gives us great pleasure and honor to ask you to come join us here on the Bema so that we may share with you a small token of this congregation's appreciation, admiration, and affection for you. you. For those who can't see it, uh, we selected this sculpture because it uh, it is comprised of all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet connected to one another as each of us feel connected to you. And the inscription reads, Cantor Michael Manovich, thank you for 25 years of music, memories, and inspiring leadership. Lynn and Barry, Lynn and Jim, Mr. Sharansky, members of historical society, clergy, and my friends. I'm thrilled to be a part of this historic event. My wife Emma and I are products of your fight to save Russian Jews, and for this, we always will be grateful. We always will be grateful uh, for the chance to raise our three children and three grandchildren in freedom. For opportunity to serve this historical congregation for 25 years. The people ask me, what do I think about those 25 years? I can tell you only that the time went like... I guess you don't see the time when you are doing work which you love. And I know that you came here tonight not to hear me speak. I know that for sure. And I'm very grateful to all of you just for coming today for being so brave and courageous as you were once or when you were on the mall.
brave and courageous. Today is another day. Um, I just want you to be very safe when you go home today. It's very important, very safe. And now I would like just to move to the music part of this evening. And just to say a few words about the program. Two years ago, Kantor Tunitsky approached me and asked if uh, I would be interested in uh, doing program in Washington and in Houston and his congregation. So I was sitting on this idea for a while. And then uh, last summer, um, I met, I've seen him before, but I've heard him for the first time, and I met uh, Cantor uh, Shrepker uh, from Dallas. And I came with another idea, to put together a concert of three of us and to call it Three Russian Tenors. Uh, why Russian Tenors? Because we all know about three Italian Tenors. We all know about three uh, Irish Tenors, of course. But who heard of three Russian Tenors? And the caveat to that also that those three Russian Tenors happen to be cantors also. And uh, we all came from the same country, and we're all serving American congregations here. Um, so we just talk, we started talking last summer, and that's how the whole thing came about. Uh, this is the first trial here in Washington. They already arranged their concert in uh, Houston and Dallas in March, uh, where three of us will appear also. And uh, you are the first trial. This is... <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, well, I'm a little bit uh, upset about those Texans who are coming here today um, because you all heard that the whole weather mess started in Texas. <laughs> and on Friday, Dallas was shut completely. All the flights from Dallas were shut. And actually, their temperature now is much colder in Dallas today than it's in Washington. Um, but thank God they came here safely, and I'm grateful to them. They're wonderful colleagues. They're wonderful. You are for the real treat. Um, we only had a rehearsal before this concert, but you wouldn't believe what's going to happen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on my colleagues. Please join me right here, and our wonderful uh, new organist and our company is David Lang our own Washington Hebrew, who just joined us this year. I would like to begin with a song which talks about our heritage. We're all standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. Somebody else came to this land, the parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and we're all beneficiary of their lives. a tree planted by someone who only imagined me what love what vision I marvel at the gift no fruit 
could be sweeter than this. I'm standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before me. As my people went from land to land, something passed from hand to hand, and it isn't just the words and stories of the ancient law. The book we study, it's the way we study, the way. I'm standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before me. I'm standing on the shoulders Today my life is full of chores Because a young man raised his voice Because a young girl took a chance I am freedom in a hairy tense. Years ago, they crossed the sea and they made a life that's come to me. In the garden, I'll plant the seed. A tree alive of you to read. The fruit will ripen in the sun. The words will sound when I am gone. These are the things I pass along. The fruit, the book, and the soul. Please join me.
seems to look for shadows. The shiner it will look to the king. Oh! 